much for joining us. Just time for a quick recap of the week. And we begin tonight with the upcoming North Korea summit, which is just two days away. And if you are wondering how hard Trump has been preparing, deep down, you know the answer to that. I think I'm very well prepared. I don't think I have to prepare very much. It's about uh, attitude. It's about uh, willingness to get things done. It's not about preparation, it's about attitude. That's not even a viable strategy on RuPaul's Drag Race. <laughs> where, oh, bring the attitude, sure, but you better also bring your knowledge of wigs, makeup, fashion and tucking technique, or you sashay away, my friend. <laughs> But Trump is undeniably confident. In fact, when he was asked how soon he thought he would know if talks were going well, this was his reply. I, I think within the first minute, I'll know. I just, my touch, my feel, that's what, that's what I do. It's not a great sign for a negotiation where so much depends on tone and choice of words that he's describing his strategy in the single most upsetting possible way. <laughs> Well, I'm going to grope my way through this. We're both going to use our tongues and mouths to bring this summit to a satisfying climax. Why is everyone looking at me weird? <laughs> but look, we still have two days until the summit, so that's two more sunsets, at least, for all of us to enjoy. <laughs> so, for now, let's move on to the Philippines. The Southeast Asian island, that is. Uh, not the teenage fan club for Prince Philip. He's <laughs> so dreamy. It's his birthday today. We, we've talked before about their president, authoritarian strongman and aspiring Street Fighter II character, Rodrigo Duterte, <laughs> who's, who's already gained notoriety for supporting extrajudicial uh, killings as part of his war on drugs. Well, this week, he demonstrated the same level of nuance to gender relations. A kiss may just be a kiss sometimes, but not when the Philippine president is delivering it. A spokesman for Rodrigo Duterte says the president's kiss of a woman on stage was an act of endearment toward Filipino workers. Now, in fairness to Duterte, it was an act of endearment toward Filipino workers. It's certainly a more creative justification for that sort of behaviour than when you're a star, they let you do it. <laughs> and, and for what it's worth, that clip didn't really do justice to just how uncomfortable the build-up to that kiss actually was. TV Movie Awards have retroactively nullified every Best Kiss winner with a press release saying, given President Duterte's recent actions, we can no longer condone kissing of any kind. <laughs> every kiss is now the worst kiss. <laughs> now, many of the Philippines were understandably upset by this, but Duterte's legal counsel insisted the whole incident was charming. The kiss was, to my mind, an endearing kiss. Coming from a fan who was so tickled pink, when he, she had the opportunity. She did it willingly and excitedly. She was tickled pink. OK, please stop saying tickled pink. I know it's not technically a dirty phrase, but you are making it absolutely disgusting. <laughs> and second, fan or not, she repeatedly pulled away from him. Sometimes women just don't want to kiss you. I'm clearly not speaking from any sort of personal experience here. <laughs> I just have a deep-rooted hunch about it. And this incident is just the tip of the iceberg regarding Duterte and sexual politics. Back in February, he told a group of Filipino workers, don't use condoms because they don't feel good, which is not great advice in a country facing an HIV epidemic. And that same month, he gave a group of soldiers a horrifying suggestion for how to deal with female rebels. Tell the soldiers, the women, tell them, call them and tell them. The mayor has a new order not to kill you, just shoot you in the vagina. So... No more vagina. You're useless. OK, so let, let's be clear about this one. Without a vagina, you're useless. It's not just appalling, it's also a searing indictment of anyone who's stuck walking around with this ridiculous thing instead. I mean, <laughs> look at it. Does anybody find this cool? I'm, I'm guessing there's not a single person in this room currently thinking, what a spiffy little gizmo we're all gazing <laughs> upon. I do hope he keeps that image on the screen forever. Now. As for the outcry over his kissing stunt, this week Duterte claimed that it was all perfectly innocent. I, I, I can only generate an emotion if I kiss a woman I love. Any other stranger is pure showbiz. Pure showbiz? 
Now, instinctively, you want to say that that's a terrible excuse, but given everything that we've learned in the past year about the entertainment industry, <laughs> pure showbiz might just be the perfect description of what is happening there. <laughs> and now, this. And now, Julie Chen has a few questions for the audience of The Talk. How awkward would it be at this point in your life for your parents to see you naked? What is the last object that you got hit by? At what age do you think it's okay to scare a child? Do you plan for the end? Do rats freak you out? Do you think you could do your job stoned? <laughs> Have you ever had to toot your own horn? Yes. Would you trust a robot to cook your food? No. Has anyone ever interrupted you in the bathroom? Yes. Do you think claiming your pet peacock is your emotional support animal is going too far? Yes. No, no, Julie. Moving on. For our main story tonight, we thought we'd update you on the ongoing Trump administration scandals that we've been calling Stupid Watergate. A scandal potentially on the scale of Watergate, but where everyone involved is dumb and terrible and bad at everything. <laughs> now, last month uh, marked the one-year anniversary of the Mueller investigation, or, as the president and his supporters call it... Robert Mueller's illegitimate runaway witch hunt. It is, and it has been from the beginning, a witch hunt. This is a witch hunt. This is a witch hunt. Basically a witch hunt. The witch hunt, if you will. It's a damn witch hunt. Yes, they've been derisively referring to the Mueller investigation as a witch hunt, which is a little ironic, because you just know, if Giuliani, Hannity and Trump had been alive back when people burned witches, they'd have had front row seats toasting marshmallows while <laughs> trying to conceal their boners. Now, it's also a strange claim, considering that Mueller's team has, in the past year, charged 20 people and three companies and gathered five guilty pleas. So if this is a witch hunt, witches exist. <laughs> Meaning, we should probably change all references on our history books to 16th century witch hunts to read, that time we were right to murder all those teenage girls in a lake. <laughs> And the fact the investigation has been moving fast is good news, because set aside for right now how you feel about Trump or politics, the question, did a hostile foreign government try to manipulate our election, is something any reasonable person should want answered quickly. And yet, an increasing number of Americans seem to want the investigation to stop. Last July, support for investigation uh, stood at 62%, but a recent poll found it's now down to just 54%, and that is troubling. Because remember, Trump has actually considered shutting the investigation down before, and if that number keeps dropping, he may well feel empowered to try and actually do it. So tonight, let's talk about the Mueller investigation. Not about its contents, because we don't know what they are yet, but about the effort to actively undermine it. Not just from Trump and his lawyers, but from, and more importantly than you might think, Trump's TV friends. Specifically, Pumpkin Dad, uh, <laughs> Captain Virgin, Bad Judge, Whiter Megyn Kelly, the Dunce Bus, the Dunce Bus Junior for Presidents, <laughs> and of course, Michael Cohen client number three, Sean Hannity, a man voted most fuckable by Nana Needs New Glasses magazine. <laughs> And if you're thinking, well, hold on, I don't watch Fox News, I tune all of that stuff out, it's actually important that you know what's been happening on it for reasons that, and I cannot believe I'm saying this, Rudy Giuliani explained best. <laughs> because when he was recently asked why he was going around spouting unsubstantiated nonsense, he offered this explanation. Eventually, the decision here is going to be impeach, not impeach. Members of Congress, Democrat and Republican, are going to be informed a lot by their constituents. So our jury... Is the Amer as it should be, is the American people. You know what? He's right. He's related by blood to his first wife, but he is right. <laughs> because, because it is the long-standing view of the Justice Department that you cannot indict a sitting president. So to the extent that Trump can be held accountable, it's going to be through impeachment, where public opinion is key. Basically, when Giuliani goes on TV, he's arguing to the jury, and that is us. And I know you're probably thinking right now, fuck, jury duty, time to act like a racist idiot to get out of it. Well, that is not a disqualifier this time, not by a long shot. So, with that in mind, let's look at a few techniques that they've been using to influence public opinion. And the first involves attempting to redefine the investigation on their terms. Because whenever they discuss it, it's inevitably framed like this. Mueller is there to show collusion between Russia and Trump, and there's none so far, so why not end it? Where is any evidence of collusion? Show us. 
Nothing so far, not a whiff. There is zero evidence of Russia collusion. So just so we're clear, everyone, four words. Conclusion, collusion, no. Illusion, delusion, yes. I just thought we'd have some fun with words. Oh, well, we didn't. We didn't have fun with words there. All we did was witness the closest anyone in the Trump administration has ever come to making or hearing rap music. <laughs> but, but it is important to remember, Mueller wasn't tasked with finding proof of collusion. The word collusion doesn't even appear in his appointment letter. In actuality, he was tasked with looking into links and coordination between the Russian government and anyone associated with the Trump campaign, as well as any matters that arose or may arise directly from the investigation. That's a pretty broad mandate. So saying the investigation has to shut down if there's no collusion is like saying a game of Scrabble has to end because you fit all the letters in your mouth. <laughs> well, congratulations, but those aren't really the rules that we agreed to. <laughs> and that is far from the only diversionary tactic here. There's also whataboutism. Now, we've talked about this on the show before. It's the practice of shifting the debate to someone else's wrongdoing. The master of this is Sean Hannity. And he responds to any negative news about Trump with epic rounds of the whatabout game. We have a two-tier justice system. What about fired FBI director James Comey? What about Bruce and Nellie Orr? What about anti-Trump lovebirds struck in page? What about lying Susan Rice? What about Christopher Steele, the foreign national that Fusion GPS hired and funneled the money Hillary did through the law firm, and the foreign national got Russian lies to influence the Amer American people in an election? What about who lied to the FISA court judges? That is a lot of names to throw up on a screen and just say, what about them? <laughs> it's also a little easy as an argument. I'll prove it. Hey, Sean, have you thought about these 15 people? What about them? What about Archduke Ferdinand, Sean? What about Cher? We're not talking about the FBI until you answer, what about Cher, Sean? <laughs> now, Hannity's point there is that other people did bad things, so therefore Trump's bad things don't count. And look, let me be clear on this. Whether or not someone else did something shitty has no bearing over whether you did something shitty. If that were true, every movie that got a bad review could simply say, what about from Justin to Kelly? <laughs> and, and the critic would be legally required to give their movie five stars. <laughs> that whataboutism is an important part of the third tactic on display here, building a counter-narrative, essentially trying to delegitimize the investigation by framing it as part of a grand conspiracy to bring down Trump. Hannity has a series of Carrie from Homeland is off her meds conspiracy boards, with <laughs> Mueller and Clinton as the head of two different crime families, and whatever the fuck is happening on this one. <laughs> well, Night after night, Hannity paints a picture where the investigation is itself one gigantic scandal, with the Democrats, the FBI, the deep state and establishment Republicans teaming up to take down Trump. And he's got a favorite phrase to convey its scope. This is bigger than Watergate. That's like Watergate's like stealing a Snickers bar. It makes Watergate look, look like Wait, stealing I mean, a I mean, Snickers they're, they're, bar. They're, they're... This makes Watergate like stealing a Snickers bar. That's just an odd number of mentions for Snickers, <laughs> considering it doesn't sponsor Hannity's show. Presumably, Snickers simply couldn't hang with big hitters like his actual advertisers, My Pillow, Rectacare Cream, <laughs> and of course, Sock Slider. <laughs> it's true. Take a look. You struggle. Uh, you strain. Uh, you're so far away. Uh, Just bending over to put on your socks is uh, brutally painful every day. Well, not anymore. Introducing Sock Slider, the pain-free, no-bend-over way to comfortably put on your socks every day. Oh, thank goodness. I have been waiting. I have been waiting for someone to invent a gadget that I can preload with a sock condom and then foot-fuck my way to comfort every morning. <laughs> now, unsurprisingly, Hannity's narratives tend to fall apart pretty quickly. Take two of the names on his family feud board, Peter Strzok and Lisa Page. They are FBI agents who worked on uh, the investigations into both Hillary and Trump. And the key thing you learn about them, if you follow conservative media at all, is that they were making sex at each other. Did these two cheating lovebirds, who are still married to other people at the time, have any opportunity to actually do their jobs at the FBI. There she is, FBI lovebird, Lisa Page. Peter Strzok and his in-office fellow FBI agent and secret lover, Lisa Page. Peter Strzok, who along with his gourmet Lisa Page, another FBI lawyer, are getting off in their fight to save the country from Donald Trump. Oh, yeah, they were fucking. <laughs> 
They were doing the nasty, doing the slam bam in the ham, stuffing the muffin, fishing for kippers. They were polking them in 44 and piercing them in 52. They slid the wand into the goblet of fire. They were dining at the all you can bone buffet at BJO Porkington's. They were having an affair. And in doing that, in having that affair, they apparently relied on FBI work phones to hide it from one of their spouses, which is undeniably bad judgment. Plus, texts like these made it clear that they very much preferred a Hillary presidency to a Trump one, which is a political opinion they're entitled to as long as it doesn't affect their work at all. And the DOJ is looking into that question right now, but Robert Mueller himself didn't wait. He removed Strzok from the investigation immediately when he learned uh, about the texts, and Page had already left. So these two people haven't been part of this investigation for nearly a year now. And the Wall Street Journal read the 7,000 messages between them and found that they show no evidence of a conspiracy against Trump. And just for a moment, spare a thought for the reporter who had to read 7,000 sects <laughs> between two horny FBI agents. That's not why they got into the game. But Hannity still brings up Strzok and Page all the time as just two of the many threads in this elaborate counter-narrative. His latest obsession is something called Spygate, the inaccurate claim that the FBI planted a mole in the Trump campaign. Now, here is what the Spygate story is actually based on. As part of the effort to investigate Russia's meddling in the election, FBI agents sent an informant to talk to two Trump campaign advisers who had suspicious contacts linked to Russia. That's it. That is the whole thing. But here is how bullshit their theory is. Republican Congressman Trey Gowdy, who you may remember led a more than two-year inquiry into Benghazi. So he is someone who is no stranger to digging for dirt on Hillary. Even he says this is nonsense. You believe the FBI acted properly in this matter? Based on what I have seen, I don't know what the FBI could have done or should have done other than run out a lead that someone loosely connected with the campaign was making assertions about Russia. I, I would think you would want the FBI to find out whether or not there was any validity to what those people were saying. Right. He's saying the FBI did what they were supposed to do. And the headline, FBI investigates possible crime, is like the headline, Domino's delivers pizza, or <laughs> Harley Davidson sells midlife crisis mobile to local dad. <laughs> yeah, no kidding, that's their whole reason for existence. <laughs> and yet, rather than accept that pushback, some Trump supporters turned on Gowdy instead. I'm naming names here, I'm through with it. Uh, I mean, Trey Gowdy <laughs> is I a complete <laughs> schizophrenic. Uh, he, he is absolutely in the service of the establishment. Uh, and, and the deep state, whether intentionally, consciously, uh, or purposefully, uh, he is exactly that. And that's the problem. Anyone who questions the conspiracy becomes part of the conspiracy itself. And for the record, the only thing that is completely schizophrenic about Trey Gowdy is his hairstyle over the years. I mean, what exactly is happening here? <laughs> look, Trey, Trey, my friend, when you are born with bad hair, just pick a look and stay with it. Trust me, man, I am an expert on this. <laughs> The point here is, this machine is now running so aggressively that even evidence can't slow it down. And if you want more proof of that, just watch Hannity actively admit it in real time. No evidence of Trump-Russia collusion. Mueller, if you got it, come on the show and tell America. And by the way, if the media... If you have more proof that this is not a witch hunt, OK, I don't believe you. Wow! <laughs> Think about that. Give me facts, and even if you do, I won't believe them. <laughs> He's basically bragging that he's proof-proof, which is a superpower that no one should want to have, like the ability to throw a baby 100 yards with a perfect spiral. Sure, it's technically impressive, but maybe don't do it. <laughs> and all this can make it easy to forget just how bad what we actually do know already is. Just as one example, we know that in 2016, Don Jr. knowingly set up a meeting in Trump Tower with a person described to him as a Russian government attorney with the promise that the person would provide information that would incriminate Hillary and her dealings with Russia as part of Russia and its government's support for Mr. Trump. And we know this not because of the Mueller investigation or because there was a spy in the campaign or because these two fuck buddies teamed up to frame anyone. <laughs> we know it because Don Jr tweeted out the emails setting up the meeting ahead of a newspaper publishing them. So th that story is just a fact and one that looks very bad for Trump. But if you think Hannity isn't up to the challenge of deflecting that one as well, just watch him go to work. Remember the now infamous 2016 Trump Tower meeting between Donald Trump Jr., a Russian lawyer, a Russian-American lobbyist and a few others? 
Oh, we have new information recently unearthed, a transcript from a 2017 Senate hearing that the Russian-American lobbyist admitted to personally knowing Hillary Clinton. So, let me get this one straight. You seem to be implying Hillary Clinton sent someone into Trump Tower to offer her opponent dirt on herself. <laughs> you know what? Congratulations, Sean Hannity. You have officially come up with the shittiest conspiracy theory ever. <laughs> and none of this even addresses the most obvious question. If absolutely everyone, from Hillary to the FBI to Trey Gowdy, was in on a deep state plan to sabotage Trump, how the fuck is he president right now? <laughs> Basically, everyone in the country got together to steal an election and then, for some reason, forgot to do it. <laughs> and, look, we could pick apart conspiracies all night, but, but there is really, at the end of the day, no point, cos there'll always be another rabbit hole. A, a metaphorical rabbit hole, that is, not to be confused with the rabbit hole, the gay club where, years ago, a young Marlon Bundo finally allowed his <laughs> curiosity to overpower his shyness <laughs> and, in so doing, met someone really special himself. But, but creating rabbit holes is kind of the point here, because I would argue that Hannity, Trump and all the rest aren't really interested in getting to the bottom of any of these questions. They're just trying to sow enough doubt that this number dips far enough below 50% to enable the whole investigation to be shut down. They are just working the jury. And if you've seen any focus groups on TV, you know that at least some jurors are really listening. I call it a farce by... Created by the deep state. It was a witch hunt to overturn an election. All of this stuff that they say that Trump did, they're finding out that the Democrats did. It's been going on for a year and a half. They've found nothing. We keep told, oh, there's something, there's something, we'll find it, we'll find it. There's nothing. Exactly. In this piece, we've argued that the tactics that you've seen tonight are transparent, illogical, and dumb. But the other thing they definitely are is depressingly effective. And the thing is, these tactics have worked in the past, quite famously, in fact. Think about it. A sociopathic misogynist millionaire evolved from celebrity to undeserving folk hero suddenly has evidence piling up that he may have done something terrible and he puts the whole system on trial. If that sounds familiar at all to you, it's because it's basically the story of OJ all over again. <laughs> Trump is going full OJ and it's working. Now, what does it mean to go full OJ? Well, in one sense, it means to murder two people. But, <laughs> but it also means to sway a jury by building a wild, implausible conspiracy that the system is corrupted. The reason Hannity throws out so many theories may well be that he knows if he can discredit any part of Mueller's investigation, he convinced people the whole thing is a total sham. And that is the same angle that OJ's lawyers took. Just listen to one of them try to discredit all evidence because of doubts that he'd raised over a blood-soaked sock. If they manufactured evidence on the sock, how can you trust anything? And the jury bought that. Although I will say, I also do have questions over how police got their hands on those socks, because the sock slider hadn't even been invented back then. <laughs> Seems impossible. And sure, sure, there are differences between the two defences. The OJ trial had, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit. We have collusion, delusion, conclusion, <laughs> illusion, which, if anything, is even dumber. And look, I'm not saying that Trump is guilty. We honestly don't know. But even if the Mueller investigation doesn't prove that Trump personally colluded with the Russians, that doesn't mean the whole thing was a witch hunt or a waste of time. The process of finding out is really important and it needs to be seen through to its conclusion. And my fear right now is that we are headed in a direction where even if Mueller comes back with irrefutable evidence, Trump could just pardon himself and put out a book called If I Did It and a very large portion of the country would fucking buy it. And now, this. And now, the entire 17-minute piece you just saw boiled down to eight seconds. All right, time for a question of the day. Should the special counsel now be shut down? Yes, shut it down. And finally tonight, some news from the United Kingdom. America's rough draft. Now, <laughs> you, you may recall, you may recall that last week we ran one of our And Now segments featuring John Burko, the, the Speaker of the House of Commons, delivering put-downs like this. You are an exceptionally boisterous fellow, and in the course of your boisterous behaviour, uh, you appear to be chewing some sort of gum. Wow! <laughs> Whoever he is talking to just got burned. <laughs> and by burned, I mean the British equivalent, which is, of course, boiled slowly over many hours until devoid of all flavour and texture. 
Now, interestingly, no one in the UK saw that segment, and not for the normal reasons of disinterest, ignorance about this show's existence, or long-standing aversion to my name and face. No, <laughs> even the people who actually watched this show in Britain missed it, because where that segment should have been, instead, they saw this. <gasps> oh, have I said too much? Have I said too much? <laughs> Our main story tonight concerns senior citizens. Yeah. It just cut to black, like I'd just been murdered on The Sopranos. <laughs> and, and the reason for that is that in the UK, it is unbelievably against the law to use footage from the House of Commons for the purpose of comedy. It's true. Specifically, no extracts of parliamentary proceedings may be used in any light entertainment programme or in a programme of political satire. And I know what you're thinking right now. You're probably thinking, lucky for you, your show is neither. Well, <laughs> fuck off, Dad! I'm trying! I'm trying my hardest! Be proud of me! <laughs> but, look, this... This actual law was written after cameras were introduced into Parliament back in 1989, and one of the MPs who wrote it claimed that it was for very good reason. There is a tendency amongst all journalists, and I, I you can't object to it, it's, it is a genuine, you know, that's how people are, uh, to uh, tend to go for the, uh, the startling and, and, in some cases, the ridiculous. So we didn't really want the situation where if somebody's false teeth fell out, uh, that was the main thing that was shown on television that night. <laughs> OK. But that would not be the main story, because this is the United Kingdom. Teeth disappoint is not a headline, <laughs> it's a given. <laughs> and, look, this law is patently offensive. Britain is supposed to be one of the world's great free societies. We came up with the Magna Carta, and we allow a product called Daddy's Brown Sauce to be sold <laughs> regardless of how disturbing that sounds. That's freedom right there. And this... This anti-satire law isn't just hypocritical, it is a legitimate burden, because it's genuinely hard to use parliamentary footage for purposes that are not comedy. <laughs> Parliament is inherently ridiculous. Here is just a few seconds of Burko quieting one politician before introducing another. They should pipe down, and if they won't pipe down, very simply, three words, easily understood, leave the chamber. Mr Ed Balls. Yes! <laughs> yes! You heard right. Mr. Ed Balls! <laughs> he is calling on this man, Ed Balls. <laughs> a former MP, now legendary in Britain, for once trying to search for his own name on Twitter, resulting in the magnificent tweet by Ed Balls, Ed Balls. <laughs> now, to not be able to make fun of footage of that man is entrapment. And the fact that we are using parliamentary footage in making fun of this means that this part of the show is now going to be blacked out in the UK tomorrow as well, which is genuinely insane and, frankly, anti-democratic. This has to change. So to drive home to UK viewers exactly what they're missing, tonight's show is going to end in two different ways. In most of the world, uh, they'll get this segment that you are watching right now, whereas in the UK, as a form of punishment, this segment will be replaced with Gilbert Gottfried reading three-star Yelp reviews for restaurants <laughs> in Boise, Idaho. Take a look. La Tapia reviewed by Ellis. This was my first visit because of a coupon. The waiters were friendly, and it has a welcoming environment. The food was OK. If I didn't have a coupon, I would give this restaurant two and a half stars. That is what Britain is getting for five long minutes, because that is all the UK deserves until they change their stupid fucking parliamentary footage law. That's our show. Thanks so much for watching. See you next week. Good night. Reviewed by Kelsey, am prepared to be underwhelmed. We went here for Saturday brunch after hearing from several sources that it would blow our minds. It was meh at best. The food was lackluster and the service was mediocre. It was also disappointing to learn that they don't offer any alternative milk options for their coffee.